from the Faculty of Biology at the Technion, <laughs> and Itai is going to tell us about evolution of developmental gene expression programs. Uh, okay, thank you very much. That is a, it was a beautiful talk and a really tough one to follow, uh, but I will try. Um, what I want to tell you about today are, um, is a, an integration of two fields that are not normally thought of together, and that is genomics, or the structure, function, and evolution of the genome, and development. That is how the organism builds itself. And uh, ultimately, what we would want to know is how changes to the genome are manifested, <clears throat> excuse me, are manifested in development. Uh, one way to, to observe that these two fields are, are not normally thought of together is that when, when we do so, we quickly arrive at two paradoxes. The first one is well known. The second one has only more recently come to light. Uh, the first one is this. When we take organisms that are extremely morphologically different, like a frog, uh, a fly, and a worm, and we look at their genomes, we see that, that actually the, the genes that the organism uses to build itself are very much conserved. It's the same sort of uh, toolkit genes that are conserved. So how, how can um, two completely different organisms be built by the same set of core genes? That's one paradox. The second one is really a product of this new age of, of genomics, where we can take a phylogeny of closely related organisms and sequence them and compare the genomes and what we see is that there's a tremendous amount of variation. There, um, there's lots of duplications, transversions, uh, quick, quick rate of uh, uh, when you make a multiple alignment, see changes. It's, it's a, a big jungle, I like to call it. And it's not clear how, given these uh, highly divergent genomes here, we can arrive at exactly the same development. So it's really the inverse paradox. Um, my my um, <clears throat> attempt today at bridging it will be to focus on the gene regulation level. Let me tell you more, though, about the, the inverse uh, paradox. Let's take these two nematodes that I'll tell you a lot more about today. One is famous, C. elegans. One was almost famous, C. Briggsy. Sidney Brenner almost selected that one. Uh, these two are morphologically near identical. Okay? When you look at, at their development, it's very hard to see it here. But uh, suffice it that you trust me that when you look at the, the pattern of divisions of the, the, the blastomeres throughout development, it's the same pattern uh, in both organisms. And, and uh, most likely, most definitely, the same cell fate map. So the development of these two nematodes is exactly the same. And yet there is this shocking realization when you look at the genomes that the genetic distance between the two worms is very large. There, for example, is uh, 800 genes in one worm that are just not present in the other worm. And we've completely sequenced both organisms. There are 30% uh, of the genes in C. elegans that in Briggsy, their orthologue has a different upstream or downstream neighbor. So some change in, in the order. There are 10% of the genes that uh, are duplicated in either one of the genomes. So the question is, how are these changes to the genome manifested in development or not manifested in development? How, how does the genome program manifest itself in development? Um, and one, one approach that I took uh, in, my, in my postdoc in Craig Hunter's lab was to examine a middle level of abstraction. So you can uh, think of the genome as one level of uh, biological extraction, uh, uh, abstraction. Then there's the intermediate regulation of the genome. And finally, the, uh, the development, the phenotype. And we wanted to know if at the gene regulation level, uh, would the transcriptomes be near identical, reflecting the similarity of the phenotypes, or would they be very distant, reflecting the, the changes that the genomes have been accumulating? So we isolated uh, these embryos, and we wanted to see exactly which genes are expressed in each one. We used the technology of uh, uh, microarrays. There was no microarray for C. Briggsy. So uh, I designed one uh, using the Agilin system. And um, this is the, the system of choice in the lab now, although very soon we will be moving to the Illumina next generation uh, technology where you actually sequence every single read. And what are the results? What are the two transcriptomes? Well, we see that there's a tremendous amount of variation between the two transcriptomes, reflecting the level of change that we see at the genome. 
So the, the regulation is very different. It, 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 the changes in the genomes are manifested in a transcriptome. <coughs> Here's how you see that here. Th this uh, is 3,600 lines, where each line is a representation of the gene expression profile of a certain C. elegans gene. So for example, here there's 1,000 genes that are all highly expressed at the four cell stage and then not expressed later on in development. And now when you ask, what are these 1,000 genes that have this certain expression profile in elegance, what are they doing in Briggsy? Well, most of them, 70% are the same, are conserved, and yet there's uh, another 30% that are each doing something different. There's a certain level of, of divergence in the Briggsy embryo. You can see that uh, here for another type of gene expression profile. These are genes that are not on in uh, the early embryo, but then get uh, turned on zygotically at the 190 cell stage. When we look at what these genes are doing in Briggsy, we see that 50% of them are conserved, do have the same expression profile, but look at this tremendous amount of variation. So the point number one that I'd like to impress upon you is that there is a tremendous amount of variation in the gene regulation between these two morphologically near identical uh, organisms. Principle number two is that these changes, when we look at which genes accumulate the changes, uh, it's not just random. It's not that, that, that uh, it's more or less evenly distributed changes. No. There are some groups of genes that, that accumulate more changes than others. Uh, and in particular, it's those genes that we shouldn't really expect to be there at all. Doan Lancet spoke yesterday about olfactory receptors, and we all know that, that they should be expressed in uh, the olfactory epithelium in the adult. Uh, the, um, the embryo should not be expressing too many olfactory receptors that we know of. And maybe there's some interesting biology there. Maybe not. Uh, what we do see is that if you take a random elegance uh, olfactory receptor, most likely in Briggsy, it will be a different expression profile. That's what we see as a group. However, when you take genes that are known to be important for development, those to be, tend to be very well conserved. So we see we see uh, a correlation between the level of conservation and the functional relevance. Okay. And how could this arise? How could this, this, uh, these changes arise? There's many ways. I'll tell you about one way that we discovered for gene expression uh, changes to arise. Well, there's this well-known phenomena that if you look at, at the genes as beads along the string of the chromosome, there tend to be islands of co-expression. So for example, uh, this is a, a publication from uh, several years ago showing that there's islands of genes that are expressed in muscle. So if, if you're a gene that's expressed in muscle, your neighbor might also be expressed in muscle too, your gene neighbor. And it was thought to, that this represents some kind of organization of the genome, some kind of compartmental, compartmentalization. However, it could be that uh, it's just so. It's just that one gene needs to be uh, expressed in the muscle and, and neighbors are actually not under selection for being expressed in the muscle. They're just kind of going along for the ride. Uh, the chromatin is opening up, the gene of, of uh, important needs to be exp expressed and the neighbors by read-through transcription may be also expressed. It's an alternative hypothesis that hasn't been uh, tested. Here, for example, are, are two neighbors in elegance uh, the, the neighborhoodness is conserved in Briggsy, and here is their expression profile. You see that the expression profile is similar for both of them, and it's also uh, conserved in Briggsy. But what happens now in this interesting case when the syntony, the, the uh, conserved order, is not uh, present? Here is one case where in Briggsy you have two genes. They have a certain expression profile. In Briggsy, they're not neighbors. I'm sorry, in elegance, they're not neighbors anymore. And you can see that one of them, the red one here, maintained the expression profile that was found in uh, Briggsy, while the other one has adopted a new expression profile that is similar to its uh, elegance gene neighbor. Uh, this is uh, one example. Here is another example. And I can show you many examples, but here is a, a summary of the data. Uh, we see that if we take co-expressed gene neighbors, then of course, by definition, they're co-expressed. Uh, now we see in, in uh, uh, the other organism, they're more divergent. There's this shift to the left on the axis of expression similarity. And now when we further distinguish between conserved neighbors and non-conserved neighbors, we see that when a gene changes its location, it also tends to change its expression. So this is um, one way to generate expression variation by kind of shuffling the decks of the genes, the expression also tends to be shuffled. Uh, however, not for all genes. There are some genes that are essential, like uh, when we perturb their function, the embryo 
suffers the dire consequence of death. And when we look at these genes, they, they also can move around. And when these genes move around, they, they do not change their expression profile. They are, they are conserved. This is a essential genes. And no matter if it's a conserved location or divergent location, it's still the same expression similarity. So this rule only applies to, to genes uh, uh, whose expression at this particular time is not so crucial. So that was the second principle, that there's a certain correlation with uh, function at the species level. However, this principle that I showed you also holds at the population level, where there's kind of like a microevolutionary process going on. Here, uh, we compared the four cell stage of uh, a British uh, elegance worm with a Hawaiian elegance worm. And again, so again we looked at uh, the early patterning genes. The early patterning genes uh, tend not to show much variation while the ones that are like olfactory receptors, they do show variation in the population. I'll show you uh, another way to look at that. We grew worms in uh, different, uh, we grew worms from different locations in different conditions. So we took worms, uh, these are C. elegans worms from England and these other nations, and we grew them in several conditions, some stressful, some just different. And we asked, what is the transcriptome? What's going on with the gene expression in, in each one? Okay, and here's an example of one gene. The color represents the intensity, and you can see that uh, for this gene, uh, the German strain shows high expression, whereas all the other ones show uh, lower expression. We did the experiment again and again, so we have triplicates, and this is what the picture that we have for one gene. So this is a gene showing variation across a strain. You can also uh, find genes that show variation across a certain uh, condition. These are genes that are slightly more expressed under heat, and there are some interesting genes that show variation across both axes, both um, certain genes that shows variation across the environment and the genotype. And it turns out that if you look at, uh, uh, we, we find many like these, we have, we have these for all of the genes, and if you look at the, uh, you know, the sum total, you see that about 6% of the genes show variation within the population. Uh, a, a similar number, 5%, show variation across the environment, and a uh, higher than expected percentage show variation across both. So a, a gene that varies across the environment also tends to vary across the genotype. And then we asked, well, what does this mean functionally? And we were really surprised um, that uh, as we expected from before, those genes that vary just uh, across the genotype, they tend to be less lethal. Okay? Here we're, we're looking at uh, lethality. So overall, 15% of C. elegans genes are lethal upon perturbation. And if you look at those genes that are, um, are most noisy, they're, they're, uh, they show variation both across the genotype and across the environment, those tend to be uh, the, the most noisy at all. So it seems as though there's this relationship where um, uh, expression that tends to change the most, the expression that tends to be the most dynamic, is also apparently least under uh, selection, more, more, most likely to drift. Um, then there was, that, that was the, the third thing that I, that I told you. So number one was that we compare these two embryos and we see a huge amount of variation. Number two is that there's a connection with function. It's not evenly distributed across all genes. Three was that this is observed not just between species, but also between populations. The same kind of dynamics is occurring at all levels. And here is a, a fourth one that was contributed from uh, Svante Pebo's group in, can you help me? Uh, in Leipzig, 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 thank you. <laughs> and what they did is they compared apes, um, the ape transcriptomes in uh, uh, certain tissues, and they showed that there is actually a uh, clock-like evolution of the transcriptome. So the level of divergence between uh, transcriptomes of different species depends most dominantly upon how many million years away they are in divergence. The transcriptome tends to evolve in a clock-like linear fashion. So I showed you four things. What do we get when we put these four things together? Well, actually, we arrive again at Kimura's uh, theory. Uh, Kimura's theory was that uh, at the sequence level, most mutations tend to be of no uh, selective pressures, and therefore they can evolve by drift in the population. And the evidence was that there's lots of change at the sequence level. Uh, if we compare species, we see lots of changes. We see that there's a constancy, so a call of molecular clock. We see that there's a correlation with, the, with function, and also that the same is playing out within the population. And I just, I just showed you evidence 
that the same thing is happening at the regulation of the genome. So this is uh, Kimura part two for the regulation of the genome. And this can be really useful. It's not just, just, uh, just a theory. It can be really helpful for us. Here we see a multiple sequence alignment. And we've learned to read this for the patterns of conservation of function and the patterns of divergence. The same can be done for uh, the gene expression level. We can take a gene's expression profile. For example, this is a certain gene's expression profile in Romanii across developmental time. And we can compare that for other species. And again, we can look for the patterns of conservation and divergence and hopefully uh, distinguish between them uh, in terms of functional. This is the experiment that, that we intend to test this hypothesis on. We're taking six completely uh, sequenced species. In fact, uh, one of these was, was sequenced by Ralph Summer, who will be speaking later on today. And uh, we're going to uh, test this hypothesis on this phylogeny. Um, this is, what I showed you is, is on many uh, genes globally, but we're also going to be zooming in on particular processes. I don't have time to tell you about uh, this in detail. But suffice it to say that we have uh, a certain gene regulatory network that controls a certain part of development. There are interesting things about it, like that there's gene duplications, Tbox8 and Tbox9, that are occurring. And it's not clear how these duplications uh, are partitioning their functions. We know from, from uh, previous work that gene duplications can have a certain relationship, for example, with alternative splicing, where both of these mechanisms can answer uh, the uh, pressure to make more isoforms of your cell. This is from a previous work. And we see that the same thing is happening at the gene expression level. This is a, a Briggsy gene that's, that's expressed uh, both maternally and zygotically. And it duplicated in the elegance lineage. And each uh, duplicate kind of sub-functionalized the, the expression. Uh, I just want to end with a, a quote from Darwin, because that's a fashionable thing to do uh, at this, this symposium. Uh, <coughs> The, this is the most famous sentence from Darwin's Origin of Species, I think, that the preservation of favorable, favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. However, uh, less cited is the very next sentence. And this is the very next sentence. Variations neither useful nor injurious would not be affected by natural selection. So actually, Darwin was the one who first recognized the distinction between three types of mutations Adventations, deleterious, and neutral. And uh, I think uh, it's time to put it back in center stage. So I'd like to close by thanking uh, Craig Hunter, in whose lab I did the experiments I described. Also, Daniel Schott was a postdoc collaborator of mine. And these are the members of the lab here at the Technion. Uh, graduate students Michal, Vlad, and Shai. Florian is a, uh, an undergraduate student uh, from Germany, and his girlfriend Beth. Tamar is the lab manager, and there are kids sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is it possible that the variation is rather small if you compare proteins rather than transcripts? Absolutely. And, and, um, there's been an initial study comparing the proteomes of Drosophila and Elegans, and there it was surprising to see that there appeared to be a convergence of similarity at the proteomic level. So it could be that all of these changes, like genomic, are being manifested, yet some, somewhat buffered at the transcriptomic level. And as you go up these levels, uh, variation is, is buffered out. And it's, I think the name of the game now is to distinguish between which changes are not buffered and, and are therefore consequential from the ones that are just noise. This is the game, selection and neutrality. Uh, you, you had quoted Darwin, but I, I, I'm not sure that's what Darwin meant. I think Darwin was saying that the neutral genes are unimportant because they're not affected by natural selection. And the recent research has shown that they are very important because they're not affected by natural selection. Uh, Absolutely. I, th I think neutrality is uh, not as recognized as it should be for actually being a creative force. For example, the, the notion of, of sub-functionalization, where you have a gene that has multiple functions, and then upon duplication, some of those functions are released from the, the policing of, of selection and can sub-functionalize, that's a very creative force, and it's, it's due to neutrality. I, I think uh, neutrality is, is a complicated notion, but if we're going to tease apart the, the effects of 
selection and neutrality, we have to get into this. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice word. Uh, can you classify those nosy genes that you find when you compare the ones versus the N2? Can we classify which genes are... are uh, those, those, those genes that were shared in between right. the one... Yeah. Right, so there's, there's uh, uh, three, between three and four percent of the genes are different between Hawaiian and uh, N2 at just the four cell stage. So overall, the developmental uh, process, the change must be actually enormous. Now, I think what, what you're alluding to is, is uh, if there are changes between Hawaiian and uh, British, then some of them might be adaptive, adaptive changes. And we, we would love to get to the bottom of, of which changes are, are adaptive which are not, we, we're not there yet. I think we, what we need is many more strains, actually like you did in your talk, to look at many, many, many strains and many, many species and to look at, at these two uh, processes together. And the, the hope is that by, by uh, uh, engaging selection this way, we'll be able to, to find out what's adaptive. Okay, maybe my question goes in the same direction. How could you ever be, uh, have a chance to discern between neutral and adaptive uh, evolution? That means if certain changes um, um, change it, some physiological uh, ca characters. It's going to be very hard and difficult to really discern that, to really identify this physiological, physiological adaptation to, let's say, uh, identify a specific kind of food uh, by, by the other uh, species wouldn't be able to do that. I, I agree it's, it's difficult, but I take I take my cue from uh, the sequence molecular evolutionists who solve the problem by just collecting many sequences from uh, the po within the population, so doing the population genetics with respect to uh, the evolution at the species level. And the idea, so for example, uh, how would we find uh, a positive selection? Well, positive selection, the hallmark of it is that there's uh, divergence between species, because one species can do something the other can't, and yet, that could also be neutral, right? The way to distinguish that is that within the population, it should be the same. So within a population, we'll, we'll see something that's held under selection, and that will be with uh, discordance to what's happening across species. I think that's, that's a, a proven method at the sequence level that should be tested. So, very nice talk. Um, I have a technical question for you. So, your approach heavily depends on that the genes that you compare are really one-to-one -one orthodox, right? Right. So the further the species are away, the more complicated it will be to make sure that they really are. So how do you touch on that? Yeah, or orthology is a huge problem. Uh, it's why we're concentrating initially on uh, a small phylogeny with Prisciancus being, being the outgroup because that's already very distant. Um, well, I think we'll just use the, the, the same tricks, collecting lots of sequences, and if a certain gene is not an ortholog, it should be outgroup to genes, to, to genes from organisms that are more closely related. So I think it's going to be just this kind of phylogenetic game. And we'll have to, to accept that, that uh, uh, we don't see intermediate stages. So for example, here, here's one nightmare scenario that, that keeps me up, is that if there is a, a gene that duplicated, that duplication is under select, um, relaxed uh, pressure, if one of those copies is now lost, I won't, I won't know that. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. I admit it. By the end of the day, the intermediate level transcriptome changes have to do with something that happens in a genome. Are you looking at promoter uh, mutations or transcription factor mutations to understand what goes on? Absolutely. Well, one of our planned experiments is to do uh, CHIP-seq, where we see for a given transcription factor what are the targets and how that uh, set of targets evolves across species, to see what, what the conservation and the diversion uh, there is too. Sure, we're attacking it from that level. Thank you very much. And, uh, so I want to thank the speakers for being uh, on time and uh, we have uh, time for a nice break and also to visit the posters uh